Freddie Gray's here. Uh, very good morning to you, Freddie. Good morning, Mike. How are you? Good to talk to you. Yeah, I'm very well indeed. There's a certain sort of a new boy, uh, buoyancy, I, I would say, in the air. Um, I know that some people are very upset, uh, and there are some women, particularly in America, who are apparently threatening to withhold sex from their partners as a result of Donald Trump winning. Um, but uh, but it's a, it feels like a brand new kind of beginning, doesn't it? It feels like the world has been given a second chance with Donald Trump. Yeah, I think there is optimism. And I, I, I was in America this week, but I, I've come back to Britain, and I'd say there's optimism on both sides of the pond. Yeah. Um, and not just from people who have liked Donald Trump for a while. I think a lot of people now uh, are seeing the possibilities of a second Trump term. And, of course, there's a sort of hardcore who will despise him forever and will be very, very upset and disgruntled. Yeah. Um, but I think you're already seeing um, Trump moving towards... Uh, a kind of unity message, unity platform in his second term. Uh, I think a couple of things are quite interesting that indicate that. One was uh, Steve Bannon went on this uh, big, amazing rant yes. about the um, about sort of the the. the the Trump world was going to come for the deep state. Yes, and, yeah, because he know, was making the point, wasn't he, that you know Donald Trump's a nice man, uh, but I'm not. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it was it was brilliantly Bannon, and you guys suck. He kept on right. saying, right. But uh, but I mean, Corey Lewandowski, a Trump advisor, said, you know, he doesn't speak for us. Right. Um, I think they're trying to say we're we're not necessarily going to do retribution um, in the way that people like Bannon might want. Right. Um, you know, this is a time for peace. And, and Bannon's kind of Bannon, in a way, is sort of yesterday's Trump man, isn't he? He's not going to be back in the White House. I don't think so. I don't think so. And another interesting appointment is uh, this chief of staff, Susie yeah. Wire, who's very much uh, a Republican establishment figure. I mean, I think there are a few people in Trump world who are a bit worried about her role. There was a lot of bickering in the Trump campaign about her and Chris LaCivita, who were the two Trump campaign managers. Right. And because they are very much re Republican establishment animals. Right. But... In a way, it's a very, very smart move because it brings the party together right. again. Uh, and you had Jeb Bush, of all people, saying what a good appointment it was. Yeah. Well, that's so, the thing. I mean, I mean, it looks as though, as well now, having come in as the kind of, you know, drain the swamp candidate in 2016, having then been president for four years, having then gone through the campaign process, losing in 2020, you know, he couldn't come back in and go, we're going to drain the swamp, because he's kind of part of the establishment now. So I think he's learned something as well, and I think he's cleverer now, perhaps, than he was in 2016. I think, I think he is. He certainly um, has a much clearer idea of what he wants to do in Washington. I mm. think it's worth remembering in 2016, he really was uh, a kind of newbie. I mean, he, he will even admit that his mistake was that he didn't understand the institutions of Washington, he didn't understand the tricks that can be used against you in Washington. Mm. He's much more aware of it now. Uh, and I think he's determined to uh, to sort of impose his agenda in a more thorough way. I mean, I think there are concerns because Trump world is a, is a strange sort of coalition of different groups. Um, and I think there are concerns that, you know, it will become chaotic mm. inevitably. Uh, and that there isn't a sort of clear enough group of people who are in charge of the, the kind of background agenda. Right. But we'll have to wait and see. I think for now there is a lot of optimism and a lot of sense of unity and, and a lot of sense of that, you know, on certain issues, immigration, uh, the war in Ukraine, they will bring a kind of purpose and a clarity um, that's been really, really missing for the last four years. Yeah, I think so. Um, and, and, and obviously people will be relieved about that. Let's just have a look at Jimmy Kimmel. Uh, big star in America, late night talk show host, um, literally in tears, apparently, about Trump being... Let's uh, be leader. honest, it was a terrible night last night. It was a terrible night for women, for children, for the hundreds of thousands of, of hardworking immigrants who make this country go, um, <laughs> for health care, for our climate, for science, for journalism, for justice, for free speech. It was a terrible night for poor people, for the middle class, for seniors who rely on Social Security, for our allies in Ukraine, for NATO, for the truth, and democracy and decency. And it was a terrible night for everyone who voted against him. And guess what? It was a bad night for everyone who voted for him, too. You just don't realize it yet. I mean, isn't it great that Jimmy Kimmel is the great source of everything? And knowledge, you know, wisdom. Um, he's the guy that you should really listen to when it comes to running the country. I mean, how pompous well, and arrogant is that? 
But what I find ridiculous, most ridiculous about those sorts of statements is it, it, it reads like, or sounds like they're reading from a script that they don't even believe themselves. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Make I mean, sure you cry or look as if you're crying at this point. The idea that it's going to be bad for journalism, I think this could be the saving grace of American journalism because the last eight years, the media in America, most of the media, has seen itself its role as being the kind of sanctioned opposition to Trump. And so they have peddled all sorts of nonsense uh, and run with stories for years that were just not true, Russiagate being the obvious example. And I think now, again, I think there's a lot of people in the media on the liberal side who are saying we need to think again. And even in the Democratic Party, yeah. I think there's a recognition uh, that, that what they've been doing is not a winning formula. Uh, I mean, saying it's a terrible te day for women is such an easy thing to say, but it's just not true. I mean, you know, abortion was a major issue in this campaign. The number of abortions in America did not go down. In fact, some studies suggest it went up last year after Roe v. Wade was overturned. Yeah. But to run on that as the sort of existential threat that women are facing yeah. was a very, very odd policy, and it wasn't based in reality. No, of course so not. Reality has sort of come crashing in. Uh, and and that's why you know there is hope because if people can get over their kind of instinctive everything about Trump and Trumpism is awful, um, then you know there is hope that people can can make a kind of America work again. I'm yeah. not going to say make America great again. So not that much <laughs> for propagandist, but I think it, it it is a time for hope. All new administrations time for hope. It's going to be chaotic. It's going to be very difficult. And you do have to face this, this point that ten, the tendency now in, in politics is that the incumbent eventually is kicked out, or mm. pretty quickly, or often is kicked out. We see it with Labour Party. They get in. They're immediately very unpopular. And Donald Trump probably is going to do things that will be very unpopular. I think deporting illegal migrants, while a lot of people feel it is necessary, will be a very, very difficult policy to do. There's going to be a lot of pushback. Mm. Mm. Um, and, and also, the, the, the sheer numbers would suggest that it's not going to be easy to, to even manage. But, Freddie, listen, we've got to run. Thanks very much indeed for your time. Freddie Gray, Deputy Editor at The Spectator, of course.